This conference will now be recorded. Again, please keep your speakers off unless you're presently presenting. It'll really avoid a lot of feedback. Um, this is Councilman Fowler's Donuts with Dan, but I think this morning you all had to bring your own donut. So, Councilman, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. And and you also, oh yeah, I can see you've got you've got a couple of them over there. Uh, I brought a donut. It's down in the refrigerator. If anybody wants it, head on over. I'll be happy to give it to you later. Um, but uh, thank you for joining us in our first uh, virtual donuts with Dan. Um, I will tell you, it's not nearly as good as being in person uh, up at the North Patrol Division, but uh, I think it's probably as good and as safe as we can do right now. Um, so our first presenter this morning is our Chief of Police, Rick Smith. Uh, I will tell you, um, we see a lot of problems in other cities. And while our police officers are human beings and they make mistakes, just like all human beings make mistakes, I will hold ours up to anybody else in the country. I think they are phenomenal. I think they do as good a job as anybody could do, uh, generally in this city. Uh, I've enjoyed a very, very good relationship with Rick, and I see Lance Lenz, our uh, North uh, Patrol Division CIO, is on the line too. Lance and I talk quite a bit uh, about various issues. Same goes with uh, our Shoal Creek officers, uh, Bill Keeney over there, uh, and I talk quite a bit. Uh, and they're uniformly helpful. Uh, they're out, they're involved in the community, and they do a, a very, very outstanding job. So, uh, Rick, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. So, good morning, Dan and, and crowd. Um, thank you so much for having me, and thanks for the kind words, Dan. Um, you know, I had a whole thing to talk about, but I'm sure everyone's going to want to hear about what's going on in the nation and uh, what's going on in our, in our city after the death of uh, Mr. Floyd in Minneapolis. Um, obviously, a horrible event. When I first watched the video, I was getting an interview with Adam, Ham, uh, Adam Hamilton at the Church of the Resurrection yesterday, and he said, what was your initial reaction? And I said, when I started watching the video, it, it, it was so awful, I had to turn away. I didn't want to watch it. Um, to watch someone on the ground like that and to see you know, someone of my profession, the profession I love and have dedicated my life to um, behaving in that manner, it's hard to watch. I, I will just tell you, it's it's very difficult for me. Um, so that that has kicked off a series of events across the country, as I'm sure all of you are probably much better informed than I am, as I have not seen a single newscast. Um, yesterday, I went into work at, at 6 a.m., as I normally do. Um, I left last night at 2.30 at the plaza. Um, we've had uh, a very peaceful demonstration early, um, rallied around 4 o'clock. Um, it, it seemed like some of the older crowd stayed for the demonstration that they had organized and then left. And then many other people started to come, and it became a much more younger crowd. Um, as the night progressed, it got much more aggressive. Um, people throwing stuff at cops water bottles, stuff. No, no one no one got any injuries, but the the uh, language, the um, yelling, going back and, um, from the crowd at the officers. Um, we, we had our helmets on, face shields. We had gas masks. We were prepared to do um, what we had to do to protect property and other people. Um, started marching through the plaza. Some windows got broken. There was spray painting on some buildings. Um, uh, minor property damage, but overall, um, people were pretty well behaved. Um, they would not listen to most of our direction. We tried to keep them on the sidewalks, asked them not to take the street. Um, they they um, started to comply. Then they they went out in the street. Uh, we would we close the street, let them march. They walked in between cars. They jumped on some cars. They threw some rocks at some cars. Um, as it got later, it got much worse. They started tearing up construction equipment on the plaza, some barriers, barricades, things like that. Uh, um, and they were given orders to disperse um, several times, about five times. Uh, we asked them to disperse and, and head home. 
Um, uh, we did use some caps done last night uh, on the group. There was five arrests total. Uh, uh, and, and I think we did pretty well last night, given the situations of other places in the country. I, I know that's not a comparison when you're talking about your town. Um, what's in store for us is we have another protest today, this afternoon, um, that is what we're very concerned about is Sunday. We have a rally that's planned for the plaza. And the I talked to the organizer last night on the phone, and he predicted somewhere between three and 8,000 people. And like I said to him, um, we, we, we support the peaceful demonstration. We will do anything we can to facilitate that, to help with it. We want to be um, a part of people exercising their, their constitutional rights. That's no problem. Um, you know, when the phone call gets to, hey, Rick, you know, I can't control everyone in the crowd. And I'm saying that's the problem with having a huge protest, right, or demonstration is we can't control what's going to happen. Um, and the mob mentality, once it gets rolling, is very hard to change the direction of. Um, and, and, and obviously, out of the people that are there, this is a small percentage overall. Now, last night, I, you know, most of our people that demonstrated, that called for the demonstration, they came, they did their thing, they had their chance, they left. It was other people that came in later in the night, maybe some stragglers that were there earlier, but most of the, the crowd, what I would say, kind of flipped its its um, its participants and, you know, it changed even though it was at the same venue. Um, so we're concerned about that. Um, we're going in this afternoon to start working on that. Um, we'll meet with all the command staff. I've been in touch with the mayor. I've been in touch with the superintendent of the highway patrol, the head of the department of public safety in Missouri. Um, I, I'm sure the governor's office is going to reach out later. Um, so we're having these discussions. Um, you know, I, I, it's a hard place to be. I, I know people are angry at police, and yet we're charged with, with being there. Um, you know, like I said last night, I wonder how much that we affect the crowd and the mentality of the crowd, because the very essence of what people are upset about is, you know, the people standing there uh, protecting them. And I wish we could change that dynamic, um, but I don't know a way to do that. Um, so we're, we're going to get through this. Um, we have used our community contacts. We were on the horn Friday. I, I'm, we'll probably call some people in today and make some phone calls about what we can do to make sure that um, we have neighborhood leaders and other reassuring people that we, we wholly support um, peaceful demonstration in this city everywhere. Um, we, want to, we want to have that. Um, we're going to ask them to please talk to their friends, neighbors, family members, and Please preach calm and and uh, restraint from letting things get under out of control. Um, that's what we worry about the most. Um, that I, I had some other things, Dan. Do you want me to go into that, or do you want to open it up to questions? How would you like to handle that? I'd like to remind everyone that if you go up to the chat function in the right hand corner, the thought bubble. Please post your questions there. We have one comment so far, but I'd like to again re um, repeat my comment from earlier is, Chief, I really believe that the, the relationships and trust that you and KCPD have built with the community are really the result of what we're seeing right now, which is, for the most part, a very calm, respectful Kansas City. I really appreciate that. I do hope this is just for me, not from you. I certainly support everyone's right to protest, but so many times you get large crowds like that together, and like my mother would say, somebody's going to get hurt. I mean, there's no, and I hope that people would remember that. I mean, sometimes it's the innocent person that gets hurt. But we can get to this comment. Again, reminding everyone, go up to the right-hand corner and post your question there. The comment that we have is from Joe Ernst. Chief, I recently read your comments on homicides in Kansas City, and I appreciated your full disclosure. You were too kind about the court system and Missouri Department of Corrections. Thanks, Joe. Chief, it's yours. Um, well, I, I needed to get some information out there, you know, um, and it's especially to you, Joe, you know, the police are the face of the criminal justice. When someone gets, you know, gets arrested, someone else, um, 
that's the beginning of the process and there's so much more to the process and someone gets let out on bond someone goes and recommits another crime but it seems like it's the police that always get the question why is this person out well you know it's been out of our hands once we handed that file to a prosecutor and the prosecutor does their job the prosecutor the judge does their job and setting bond and, and sentencing and all of that stuff and corrections and the jail there's there's many layers probation and parole there's many things that happen after the police have a touch in the system and what i'm saying is during COVID 19 we were the only people who were out there working 24 7 365 many of these organizations went home I, and and i mean completely shut down we, we were having trouble getting people even charged in violent crimes um so I, I will tell you that um, we need that support and Kansas City needs it more than ever. If, if we see what's happening in our city and the amount of violence that's happened, the amount of gunfire, we have got to have support from other agencies. And you know, I've said this many times that it can't just be the police, whether it's neighborhoods, whether it's faith-based, whether it's education, whether it's the other components of the criminal justice system we all have to be operating at our best we can't have a you know a reduced a 25 or 10 percent effort into this problem and expect a different outcome we all have to be operating at a hundred percent to try and have an effect on what's happening in our city that's my belief uh, thank you chief councilwoman park shaw has joined us did you want to make a comment uh, I'll just say good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, Raina Parkshaw from the 5th District. Uh, just glad to be here. Thank you. I, I suspect Raina is really here for the, the uh, last presenter, who is Michael Shaw, and they are somewhat related, I understand. <laughs> is this performance going to be judged? <laughs> I think I, I was, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, of course. Again, anyway, we'd uh, ask that unless you're presenting that you keep your um, speakers off so we can avoid feedback. Are there any additional questions for the chief or comments? Please post them in the chat section. Just for everybody's edification, Deb will, I'm not paying attention to the chat box. Uh, Deb will uh, observe that and she will uh, field the questions to me. If I start looking at the chat box, I'll be reading that and not paying attention. I don't want to do that. So, uh, Chief, uh, was, were there other things that you said there were some other things that you were going to talk about? Go ahead. Well, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, with the violence escalating in Kansas City as it has during this period of time, we really need to be engaged. It is so hard. I, that's why I so much appreciate the invite to this, Dan. Um, I'm asking all of our community members and have been that we need to try and stay engaged. You know, we've, we've created the perfect storm uh, and we, I mean, society, I, it's no one's fault. I'm just saying that with this isolation thing and not being able to talk in person to people is a struggle during these times when we're facing these challenges. Uh, so to have venues like this, to have to be able to reach out and connect with people, let people ask questions, get honest feedback about things. I, I think that's what's needed in this time. And I appreciate people making the effort to make that happen. So thank you, Dan. Thank you, Chief. I, I appreciate it. I want to echo Deb's comments a minute ago. Um, and we certainly have issues in this city, uh, but uh, uh, I think our, our police department's probably the best trained in the country. Um, and uh, they're very, very well led. And uh, for us in the Northland, Rick has been uh, a shining star because uh, uh, he, is, he has paid attention to us with, I, I don't wanna uh, put down anybody else, but uh, we've gotten some attention up here where we didn't have it in the past. And that's, that's very greatly appreciated. Um, I, I will talk, say something, a couple of years ago when Doug Niemeyer, he's now a major, uh, but he was uh, a captain at the time and he was the uh, uh, liaison between the council and the, and the police department. And uh, uh, Scott Simon is doing that now and they're up on the 22nd floor talking to us all the time about just whatever needs to be talked about. But Doug pointed out to me that 
couple, well, it was probably three or four years ago, there was um, a big rash of violence in the Northeast neighborhoods. And the community came together and said, we're tired of this. And they engaged with the police department and they engaged with themselves probably as significantly. And within a year, that violence dropped precipitously, radically. And it was because of community engagement that it dropped. Uh, that kind of community engagement, I like to think we have it up here, but it needs to happen citywide uh, because the police can enforce the laws, but uh, when it comes to other aspects of reducing violence, the neighborhoods and the citizens are a very integral and necessary part of that. So uh, we need to keep engaged uh, and be vigilant and work with uh, with all of our agencies across the board. So uh, if there's nothing else, Deb, is there anybody else in the chat box? Yes, there is. But before I go to that, I neglected to, to do the little commercial that I'm really proud to do. I'm Deb Herman from Northland Neighborhoods. Northland Neighborhoods is sponsoring this go to meeting. And I want to acknowledge, and I hope I don't miss anyone, um, Councilman Fowler is a former chair of Northland Neighborhoods. And we also have Mary Jo Burton, who is calling in from a long way away. And we're glad that you're here this morning. Um, with that, we have one. Frank Thompson for the Chief says, where do things stand with improving cultural diversity in KCPD in all jobs? Can you say the question again, Deb? Is it improve cultural diversity? Did I get that right? Yes, where do things stand with improving cultural diversity in KCPD in all jobs? Well, we have it. Our, our in-service is attended each year by every member of the department. We have cultural diversity every year. The academy has about 35 hours of training involving some sort of cultural diversity. Um, so officers or new, new officers are exposed very heavily to that. We have many outside presenters come into the academy and then it's reinforced every year. So I, I, I believe we have a, a very good um, um, platform for that. Uh, now, could we always do better? Sure. But a, a, as I'm sure everyone understands, training time is limited in the department as we try to pull people out of their jobs to go to training. So we, we get about 24 hours. Everyone has to mandate it 24 hours. Now, other people get intense training if, if they're in some other kind of jobs, like our community interaction officers might get more training on interpersonal skills and, and dealing with people, um, septet training, stuff like that, or homicide people get more interrogations and all that. But all of that has a relation-based training, um, and that is how to connect to people. So I would say the police department is very well-versed in that subject. Um, just noticed, cannot um, ignore our present chair of Northland Neighborhoods, President, is also on here, J.C. Sanders. Thank you for being here. We have an additional question. Um, how do neighborhood watch groups get organized, and what responsibilities do they owe to the police department? Uh, that's a great question, Deb. You know, uh, Jason Cooley's been working hard on some neighborhood watch programs. The Northeast um, uh, has a they have more of like a virtual neighborhood watch where they do um, on the computer text messages rather than driving around kind of thing. Um, and it's worked really well for them. So I would get in contact with the CIOs and they will help you set that up. Um, I, to Dan's point about neighborhoods and taking control, you know, when Northeast had a problem in their park, um, they, they had a beautiful park and it was overrun with homeless people and people that we didn't want using the park you would feel bad bringing your kids to, right? And the answer to that was get the park used by families and the other people will leave. Well, they put in a giant slide and some other things and all of a sudden you wake up on a Saturday morning and that park is full of kids yelling and screaming and parents watching them and the park dynamics changed. And to Dan's point, strong neighborhoods have less crime. Strong neighborhoods have less problems. And so anything we can do to facilitate that, uh, a block watch, uh, community meetings, you know, donuts with Dan, anything we can do to help facilitate that, the police department's all in. 
I would like to say for those that are in the Northland, um, Officer Lenz is, is a great contact at North Patrol, and Rick Jones and Bill Keeney at Shoal Creek do an excellent job. Um, Northland Neighborhoods is very active in getting Block Watch groups set up and organizing those neighborhoods. Just call us if you need help. I see no additional questions for the chief, Councilman. Hey, Deb, can I ask you a question? Yes. Sure. Hey, when you set those up, Deb, are you are you all doing the virtual kind of block watches where you do it more electronically rather than like driving around kind of thing? We don't encourage, and in fact, our program does not include patrolling at all. This is where you watch and report. Yes. Um, we don't encourage people to follow people or patrol their neighborhood. It is watch and report. It's being engaged in your neighborhood, knowing who's supposed to be there and what's supposed to be going on and reporting. I'm sure, Chief, you would agree with me. It is amazing when you go out and somebody says, well, I saw something at 2.30, but I didn't want to bother the police, or I didn't want to be a nosy neighbor, so I didn't call know your neighbors and report suspicious activity but no we don't and every neighborhood is different on how they communicate more and more it is virtually some are still using the phone and they're calling everybody or they're getting together in, in um, neighborhood meetings we will accommodate whatever is comfortable for them um, i don't know how many block watch groups we also have signs in the northland that northland neighborhoods provides um, which I think those signs tell the bad element that we're organized. We care about our neighborhood and we don't welcome your bad activity. So no, it's a very, very successful program. We appreciate Excellent. it. I just wanted to make that clear, Deb, because I think it's important for everyone that, that hears that's what we mean, right? When we're talking about the block watch. Absolutely. It is, it is be aware of what's supposed to be going on and report. Um, and the biggest um, help that it provides is the relationship with the police department. Um, those individual officers and the department as whole, knowing how they can help and knowing how you can help. But no, we don't encourage patrol. In fact, it, it's not part of our program. All right, if there's nothing else, Chief, thank you very, very much. Uh, you know, you know how to reach me. Uh, Lance certainly knows how to reach me. He calls me at least once a week just to see if I need anything. And uh, um, Joe and Bill uh, are uh, in contact as well. So uh, I appreciate your efforts and thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me, Dan. And I apologize, I have to run. My phone is already blowing up, but I have to start preparing for tomorrow. So I'm gonna have to run. All right, thank you very much. Thank you all, take care. Thanks. Um, our next presenter is um, a guy I've known for a long, long time. Frank Thompson is uh, the De Deputy Director of Health. Uh, Frank also serves on the board of uh, Northland Healthcare Access, and that's where I got to know him. Uh, he and I, okay, Frank, you're muted, so unmute yourself. There you go. I'm not on that board anymore. Oh, you're not? Huh. Hey, that makes two of us, neither am I. <laughs> but uh, he was on about as long as I was. Uh, and uh, he and I got to know each other pretty well. And uh, I was very, very happy when he got uh, um, promoted to deputy director of health. Frank is a second district resident. And uh, so he's, he's one of my constituents. So I asked him to come and talk to us this morning about uh, what is uh, certainly uh, on the top of everybody's mind right now, along with uh, our crime issues, certainly, but right up there is uh, uh, probably equal is our response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and uh, where we are right now in the city with regard to that, any other health issues he wants to talk about. So, uh, Frank, go ahead. All right. Thank you for, for the invite. Um, and I'm going to try and get through this um, as quickly as, as possible so that there's um, plenty of time for questions. But I did wanna just give a few updates on um, where we are right now and 
Um, how do we, as a community, move forward? Um, next slide. To optimize your ability to see this presentation, if you go up to the top middle of your screen where it says View Everyone and change that to Hide Everyone, it will maximize the presentation. You can change it back later. Again, put your questions in the chat. Thank you. Um, so just a message from us. Thank you. Thank you to Kansas City for staying home and um, still encouraging folks to keep that up. Um, keep your, 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 your outings to a minimum um, to just what's necessary. Um, although the, um, the peak of this is past, we are still not, not out of the woods in terms of this virus. Um, we continue to get reports every day of new cases, um, new outbreaks. Um, and the, the real concern is um, really kind of keeping this suppressed so that we don't end up having to do a second shutdown because um, that would be even more devastating than the first one. Next slide. So this is where we are right now in Kansas City. So the, the black line is our, our cumulative case count. So you can see it continues to climb. Um, and then the blue lines on there are our daily um, reports. Um, the one big line you see there towards the middle of the, um, of the screen, um, that was that was the um, week that we received all of the reports from the um, food processing plant up in um, St. Joe, um, where there were a number of Kansas City residents who work in that facility. And we wound up getting over 60 cases um, reported, just Kansas City cases reported just out of that facility. Um, so that's what was responsible for that big peak. But other than that, you see, we, we continue each week to get um, to get new reports of, of cases. Next slide. Um, here's how that breaks down across the city. Um, to your left, there is a map that shows um, what things look like in terms of numbers of cases by zip code across the city. And then the map to the right shows what it looks like in terms of crude, um, crude case rates. Um, and in public health, we, we use the case rates because what that tends to do is kind of normalize, um, normalize um, between population size difference because all of our zip codes don't have the same population in them. So having 100 cases in um, 64120, versus having 100 cases in um, 64130, um, it's, it's a real big difference. Um, 20 has a much lower population, so 100 cases there, well, 100 cases anywhere would be of concern to us. I probably should have said 10. Um, but having, having a number of cases there versus the number of cases in 30, is a is a difference so we tend to look at rates and when you look at the rates on the right there um you see um really a concentration the um, northeast portion of kansas city missouri and then that line of um that basically approximates the truce um, and prospect corridor going down south but you also see some areas up north of the river um 64126, 171819, and then if you look over um, um, 64153, is also now starting to um, starting to pop up when we look at it in terms of case rates. Now, part of that is population density out in 64153, um, but it is something that that we'll be keeping a, a, a watch on. In the middle of the screen, there are is a breakdown by council district, and as you can see, when you look at it in terms of rates, um, third district has the highest rate in the city, followed by fourth district, um, then first district, second district, and then um, fifth district, and lastly sixth district. When you look at the breakout by race um, and in terms of rates. Um, 
there's been a lot of talk about the impact in the black community and in terms of numbers, um, black cases in the black community still represent about 37% of our total cases. Um, that's actually dropped at one point, it was 50%. Um, so that is starting to drop a little bit. Um, but when you look at it in terms of rates, um, what's going on in the Asian and, and Hispanic community is something that is of concern. A lot of that is tied to um, work in um, food processing um, facilities um, and other industries um, like that. Um, so again, something that we're keeping an eye on whenever we get a report of a case in one of those facilities. Um, our folks really do um, jump on that and work with the state to try and make sure that um, the staff in those facilities get tested. Next slide. Um, so this is something that's been talked about nationally, and I just want to take a, a minute to talk about it here locally. Um, in the absence of a vaccine, how do we how do we get this under control um, so that we can so that we can move forward with uh, whatever our new normal is going to be? And I say the new normal because people keep talking about well, we want to get back to normal. We want to get back to normal. We're not going to get back to normal. Um, there will be a new normal. After 9-11, we did not go back to normal. We created a new normal. Um, and the same will be true after, after this, um, after this um, global pandemic is over. So step one of this, um, of this box it in strategy that um, the CDC developed is to test widely. And on the testing front, from a city perspective, we have started ramping up community testing events. We're working with our three federally qualified health centers, Sam Rogers Health Center, Swope Health Services, and KC Care. Um, and we are doing anywhere from four to six testing events per week um, at different locations around the community. I've, in a slide coming up, I've actually got the testing locations for next week. Um, in addition to that, um, Truman Medical Center is doing testing. Um, we just received um, word this week that um, a few of our CVS stores here in the Kansas City region will start testing. Um, some of the Walmarts have already been testing. No one really knows right now exactly how many tests are being done on a daily basis in Kansas City because none of this is centralized. Um, there is a group with the Mid-America Regional Council that is, is, is trying to um, start pulling together that information um, so that we get a better sense. In order to really get a handle on this, the estimates are that for Kansas City, um, we need to be doing between 700 and 800 tests a day. And for the Kansas City Metro, we need to be doing 3,000 tests per day. Um, Right now, I know with the city program that we're doing, uh, we're doing we're pumping out about 350 to 400 tests a week. Um, so we've hit half of that number with our testing. I would assume the test with the testing that Truman is doing, um, with the testing that's going to be coming online with CBS um, and some other groups that are out there doing testing. We may be pretty close to that, um, you know, that 700 to 800 range, if not past that. The second step of this box it in is isolate. And I, I really can't emphasize this enough. Um, when we talk about when someone has, has tested positive, our folks, our disease investigation staff reach out to them and will tell them, okay, you are positive, you need to isolate yourself. Um, not only from folks outside your home, but even within your home, you need to stay in a separate bedroom. If you've got the ability for, your, for the person who's infected to have a separate bathroom, they need to also have a separate bathroom. But every week, our disease investigators, as they're following up with people and asking, well, have you been isolating? They'll get a comment, well, yeah, other than when I have to go to the grocery store. And for us, that is like the most frustrating comment in the world. 
because you, you have just gone out and potentially um, exposed additional people. So um, really helping us spread that word. If you know people, um, if someone shares with you that they've, um, that they've tested positive, really emphasizing, are you staying at home and staying away from everyone else? Right now, that's the only way we're gonna get ahead of this disease is stopping the spread. Um, number three here is find everyone who's been in contact with infected people, also known as contact tracing. Um, and, you know, that's been getting a lot of press here lately. And, you know, I'm, a lot of people are contacting us saying we want to be contact tracers. And it's, it's not just as easy as making a phone call. The, those contact tracers, I've been in public health for over 25 years. I know I couldn't walk down to the second floor in our building and pick up one of those phones and start doing contact tracing tomorrow. Um, that's not the skill set I've developed over my career. Um, those folks have to deal with some very tough situations. Um, they have to protect. Um, they have to protect the privacy of the individual's um, information, and sometimes that that even means having to interview a spouse and not reveal to them that the person that the reason they're talking to them is because of their their spouse. Um, so those can become some very touchy and difficult conversations. And how do you establish a rapport with people in order to be able to pull information out of them? Um, and a lot of these folks, when you know, I have a lot of experience. I spent eight years working in the area of HIV, um, running our HIV program for the metro region, and um, you know, always admired the fact that. Um, those disease investigators, and in particular here in Kansas City, ours, they don't just make that initial phone call, take down your information, enter it in a database, and then go on their merry way. They follow cases to the very end. And oftentimes in the HIV world, years after someone's initial diagnosis, they would change their status in terms of what their risk factor was because of information they've drawn out of those people over years of contact where they finally admit what their real exposure was. And you know, the same happens here. It takes, it takes days and weeks of them talking with people to finally get someone to admit where they may have been exposed, especially if they were somewhere where they weren't supposed to be. Um, quarantine is the um, fourth step in that. So as we identify those people who have been exposed, getting them to also separate themselves. Quarantine is a little less restrictive than isolation. Um, but again, it's a critical part of, of this box it in strategy. Um, next slide. So here's our community testing coming up for next week. Um, and there's, um, there's one site in the Northland here at Northgate, Ella, um, Northgate Middle School on Tuesday. Um, all of these sites are currently available to any Kansas City, Missouri resident. The ordinance that the city council passed to have us start doing community testing asked us to focus on 15 zip codes. Um, so that's where we're locating these testing events, but any Kansas City resident can go to any event and get tested. And um, I'm, my understanding is the money has started to come in from Clay County and Jackson County. So as those dollars become available, we'll expand our eligibility to include Clay County residents outside of Kansas City, Missouri, and Jackson County residents outside of um, outside of Kansas City, Missouri. These are these tests are free of charge. Each day the testing runs from 11 to 4, or until supplies run out. We allocate about. Um, well, not we allocate. Those providers bring about 100 tests to each testing event. Um, so they will do tests until those, until those run out. 
um, or until we hit four o'clock. You do not have to have symptoms to get tested at these events. A lot of the testing events going on in the community still require um, symptoms. I know that Truman Medical Center is still requiring symptoms in order to get tested at their events. Um, these events um, do not require that. Um, must be seven years or older. Um, we may be lowering that here in the next couple of weeks because there's new guidance out from CDC. But as of right now, seven years and, or older. Um, and we are using the um, nasal for drink, nasal pharyngeal swabs, uh, the test that we're using. Um, those are the one that do go deep into the nasal cavity all the way to the back of the throat. It's uncomfortable, but it is not painful. I had a test last week um, and, you know, th thought they were going to get some gray matter on that on that Q-tip, um, but it, it is not painful. It is just uncomfortable. It's something you're not used to. Um, and although these are drive up events, we do welcome people to walk up if, if there are individuals that are using tr public transportation to get to one of these um, events or an Uber or um, some other ride sharing. We do allow people to do walk up testing at these events. Um, we've got them structured as drive up because that that helps to contain and keep people separate from each other. Um, so that we don't have to worry about um, social distancing, um, but walk-ups are, are definitely um, allowed at all of these events. Next slide. Oh, last point on this one. Um, prior to this, it's all been um, on-site um, registration for these um, tests. As of yesterday, um, we have stood up a COVID testing call center at the health department. And those calls are being routed through the city's 311 system. We chose to go through 311 because that's a, that's a system that every resident in Kansas City, Missouri is familiar with. Um, so if individuals call 311, the prompt in that, the very first prompt in that system will allow you to be redirected to our call center. That call center is available. Um, 8.30 to um, 4.30, um, Monday through Friday, um, to schedule appointments. And the way that is going to work is if you schedule an appointment, you are guaranteed a test on that day. Um, so even if, even if we start running low on tests at one o'clock, which has been happening at a number of our sites, if we've got appointments scheduled for later in the day, those tests will be set aside for those individuals. So if someone's got a 3.30 appointment, when they pull in, their tests will be there waiting for them. Um, next slide. Um, so how do we move forward um, in, in dealing with um, move forward from this. So first is public health capacity. Um, I talked a little bit already about um, testing patients and tracing um, contacts. Um, a stronger health system um, able to withstand the rise in cases without risking health workers and patient lives. We've been extremely lucky, lucky here in Kansas City. Our hospitalization rate has never um, really has never exceeded our capacity. We've been watching our bed capacity here in Kansas City. Um, in fact, we've, we've only had 107 reported cases that required hospitalization. Um, so although it was a challenge, it, does, it did not put our health system at, at risk. Um, but a lot of that is, is about making sure that those individuals who are at highest risk, so those who are elderly and those who have chronic disease conditions, especially chronic conditions related to respiratory issues, making sure that they don't get exposed. Because those are the people that when they get exposed and they um, come down with, um, with the disease, they're the ones that are most likely going to end up in the hospital in an ICU bed. Um, so, and it'll get to this, the issue of masks that I'm going to touch on at the end of this. 
Um, and then as falling, as we get falling case rates for all groups, um, we need to make sure that as we reopen that it's always based on our health data and the economic data. It can't be one or the other. It's got to be both. Next slide. I think you got to click one more time. Yeah, there's a couple of drop ins here. This, this, this is my boss's slide, not mine. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I wanted to share this with the group. Um, this is actually the case the case tracking from the 2003 SARS outbreak in Toronto, Canada. And I share this because you see there that there's two peaks. And what happened in this situation is you see there in the middle um, where the labels are, that at one point the city thought that they were past the outbreak and so they declared um, the outbreak over and they opened the city back up. People stopped wearing their masks um, and then cases shot right back up. And we want, this is the situation we want to avoid in Kansas City, well across the country, but particularly here in Kansas City. Um, we don't want that second spike. Um, a constant trickle of cases we can manage, we can handle, but if we get another spike, um, we've got folks in our department that have been working 60, 70, um, some even 80 hours a week for the last two months, and they are pretty close to burnt out. Um, if we don't get a break where they can get some time to be away and recharge, um, um, I don't know that we'll be able to handle a second wave. And the, the thing that is really concerning to us in public health is the possibility that a second wave of this could hit in the fall at the same time as our seasonal flu hits. So we could actually have two outbreaks going at the same time. Um, that is the thing that has us really, really concerned. Um, and uh, another reason why in these summer months, it's really important for us to get this, get the um, level of, of COVID infection down in our community um, so that that doesn't, we don't face that double threat in the fall. Um, next slide. Um, this last one, um, Wearing masks, and I, I pulled these um, historical photos. The, the top three are from the, um, the 2018, I mean, the 1919, 19, 18 um, flu pandemic. And you see there the, the different community settings where people are out wearing their masks. Um, we're wearing the mask back then. And then the picture at the bottom is actually from Kansas in 1935 during the Dust Bowl um, um, crisis. So at that time, wearing masks in public was seen as part of, um, it was part of the social expectation. It was part of civic pride. Um, your mask protects me. My mask protects you. It's, it's a community effort. For some reason now, um, wearing masks in public has become politicized. And that's, that's something that's got us in public health really concerned. Um, when we ask folks to wear masks in public, it's, it's, not about, um, it's not about trying to infringe on people's individual liberties. It really is about trying to protect the community as, as a whole. Right now, um, you know, the temperature checks and the symptom screening um, it has a limited impact as a preventative measure because right now a sizable portion of the new cases are asymptomatic. They're individuals that aren't showing any symptoms at all. Um, so the only way to protect um, against that is the public is wearing the mask in public. Um, it still surprises me when I pull up to stores and I'm looking at people coming and going out of the store and 
Most of them don't have a mask on. And usually in those instances, I start my car back up and pull out of the parking lot. I, I simply refuse to expose myself like that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, have, I have multiple chronic conditions myself, including asthma. Um, so I'm one of those high risk individuals. If I were to get exposed to this and come down with COVID, um, there's a very good chance I'd end up in the ICU. Um, so that's just not a risk I'm willing to take, but it, it's, you know, it's, there's a limit to how much I can protect myself. I have to depend on my fellow citizens to also help me out in that regard. Um, because the, the mask really doesn't protect, the mask protects more virus going out than virus coming in. Um, by capturing what you're breathing out, it keeps, if you are an asymptomatic carrier, it stops you from spreading that virus out into the environment. Um, and that's really the function of, of the mask. And I, I see a lot of people driving around in their cars by themselves with a mask on. And it's like, who, who are you protecting yourself from? Um, it's the, the mask is really about you protecting those around you. Um, and I'll leave it at that. I know there are a couple of questions that came up. I saw one about the situation down in the Ozarks. Um, for, for us in public health, for me at least, I'll speak for me. When I saw those images, that broke my heart. Because um, I know across this state in another two weeks, we're going to see a surge in cases. Um, you know, and after all the hard work that has happened, all the sacrifice that has happened to get us to the point where we could start reopening, start allowing businesses to try and recover, um, that that many people chose to put a week in of fun ahead of the well-being of our state and our city was just heartbreaking. Um, if someone can read off the other questions, I, I can respond to those as well. Uh, I can interject a quick comment, and that is that, uh, and because I've got a slide up, I can't see who's on the screen anymore, but Randy Park Shaw, my colleague on the city council, uh, has been made a co-chair of the health commission. I was also appointed to the health commission. So we're, we are very immersed in this uh, and uh, uh, we're trying, I'm, follow it fairly closely. I also comment that uh, you know, I don't make any secret out of the fact that I was diagnosed with diabetes when I was 18. So I, I have a compromised immune system, which is part of it. But I saw this the other day that if I get this, I have a one in 10 chance of dying from it just by virtue of diabetes. I'm not too anxious to get it. And I do wear a mask, but I'm going to be out in public. Uh, and uh, I have to be out in public quite a bit. If I walk into a, a grocery store, I, my mask is on. Uh, and that's for my protection, but the protection of other people there. And like Frank, I'm disturbed when I walk in and see the number of people that, uh, that don't wear that. As the situation down in, in the Lake of the Ozarks, I looked at that, you know, if I'd never heard of COVID-19, there ain't no way I'd have gotten in that water. Uh, it was just way too crowded and all those people drinking and stuff. I don't know what they were doing in the water. So I don't want to think about that. But uh, think about that if you want a reason not to go to lunch. OK, that, that might help you get past that. So anyway, uh, Deb, can you uh, are there any questions that, that Frank needs to respond to? Yes, we do have most of the questions. Um, if I don't cover yours, most of the questions, I believe, were covered in your presentation, um, but we do have one. What is your opinion of the safety of having Homes Association pools open? Um, at, at this point, um, we, we would recommend against it, because, and, and the reason being that, you know, like with Lake of the Ozarks, once you open up a venue like that and people are in, especially younger people and children, once they're in and they're having fun, caution gets thrown to the wind. So any messages about social distancing um, and, you know, 
the the frequent hand washing is is going to get thrown to the wayside um also the issue with pools if you're not cleaning properly that that moisture on all you know that gets on all the surfaces around the pool just that's the nature of being around a pool everything's going to get damp um, is is a perfect environment for um, harboring um, the virus on surfaces. For the most part, the virus doesn't live well on surfaces, especially um, when exposed to sunlight. Um, but the moisture can help that that survival rate. Um, so at this point, um, not recommending it. Um, realizing though that you know. It's not something we're going to prohibit. In fact, our inspectors are out inspecting pools. They were inspecting pools for um, homes associations and, um, and hotels and apartment complexes um, before Memorial Day, I'm trying to get as many of those certified before Memorial Day. A lot of them wound up not opening because of temperature issues. Um, but it, it's not something we're going to prohibit, but I wouldn't recommend it. Well, it is, sounds to me that you and I are probably in agreement that we all need to return to be as productive as we possibly can be, but to take extreme caution and wear masks and avoid groups as best we can, especially if you're in a risk age group or a risk category because of other health complications. Exactly, yes. We have a question here um, from Vicki Paddock. Are we able to do anything to protect or educate people from COVID at the rallies in our city? I'm concerned about re the resulting jump in infection from those gatherings. Yes. Um, yes. Um, you know, and I think um, if, if um, Chief Smith was on, he'd, he'd agree with me here. Um, it's hard to get any kind of messaging out at, at an event like that. Um, you know, that that is something I am actually planning to go down to the event tomorrow, um, at, at least for the, um, the afternoon portion of it when it's going to be a structured event and more under control. Um, you know, because as a black man living living in this country, these these are issues that are relevant to me. They um, they hit me close to home. Um, and as much as possible, we can try and spread that message. But I think it, you know, in that moment, that is the last thing on people's minds. Um, you know, when I go down, I'll be out on the edge, staying away, but I do want to be there and be present. Um, but I can't be in the middle of that crowd. It's just too big a risk for me. Thank you. Um, we also have from Richard Hurtig, expectations of additional initiatives associated with flu shots, recommendations for timing of the flu shots, flu shot early in the season, question mark, Will the availability of flu shots be reduced due to complications associated with the pandemic? Um, at, at this point, we haven't received any any notification about um, possible reductions in availability of flu shots. Um, CDC is still working on guidance. Um, you know, they've still got to do the research on um, whether or not um, it, there's any benefit to folks doing a flu shot earlier. Um, this time around, one of the concerns about doing the flu shot early is they have a limited period of, um, of effectiveness. So if you do a flu shot early, you'll end up having to do a second one before the flu season ends in the spring. Um, so we usually try and recommend that folks get their flu shot around, um, around October or so. Um, but there have been suggestions that it might be um, it might be advantageous for folks to do that either in September or late August, but again, CDC hasn't issued the final guidance on that. Um, as soon as they do, we will adjust our messaging here locally. Um, I believe our, our folks have already ordered our flu supply for the upcoming season, 
And to my knowledge, there was no change in our order. Oh, really, stay tuned is the message on that one. Amy Justice wants to make sure people remember to call 311 to schedule your appointment for the COVID testing by 5 p.m. on Monday, June 1st for the Northland testing location set for June 2nd, which is at Northgate Middle School, I believe. Yes. Um, remind people that if you want to ask a question or make a comment, do that in the chat section of the page. I hope I, I know there's a question about planning that I thought I would leave to the end for the councilman. If we don't get to your question, um, Councilman Fowler will get the, these chats and he can respond to them later if he'd like to, or I'm sure that he would. Yeah, I will. Other, Absolutely. other questions or comments for Mr. Thompson? Very, right. in, very informative, very but upsetting at the same time. Yeah. Uh, Frank, thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Uh, appreciate Welcome. your comments and your help. And we will, uh, uh, well, I've got your personal cell phone number. <laughs> we'll be in touch. <laughs> I'm going to go next to uh, two of my favorite people in the world. Well, Frank's one of my favorite people in the world, too. I mean, you know, but... Uh, uh, Michael Shaw and Forrest Decker, and this is probably a good time to do it because Raina is paused. Uh, so if she's not in the room, you, you maybe have a little more flexibility. But uh, if you remember a couple of years ago, our trash pickup in the Northland was awful. And yes. these guys stepped in and they got on top of it. And um, uh, we have since taken over the trash collection and yeah, we get a missed call every once in a while. Rain is back now. Sorry, Michael. Uh, we get a, um, um, a missed call every once in a while, but it's just, it's, it's not in nearly what it was back then. So I have a personal thanks to both of you for getting on top of that. And so I asked them to come and present and talk to us about the status of things right now. And uh, if you just take a few minutes to do that, uh, I'd appreciate it. So thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you, Councilman, for having us. Um, I'm Michael Sean, the manager of solid waste for the city of Kansas City. Uh, Forrest Decker is on as well, and uh, he's assistant manager. And uh, yes, uh, we, we recognized uh, the significant issues that were going on in the Northland. You know, at the end of the day, trash is a basic service. It just needs to be picked up. I mean, there's, there, there's no secret science to it. It's not a hard thing. It's just you got to go do it. You know, you can't complain about what your work is, the weather, the heat, whatever, whatever, whatever. You know, I have this saying, it's not my, you know, that's not my problem. And so I, I feel like it's not my constituents problem that we have these problems. They just expect the stuff to get up. We're talented people. We can figure out those those problems and come up with solutions. Um, and so um, with the support of Councilman Fowler and Councilwoman Hall, um, the city ultimately began taking over trash collection services citywide. It began May 1 of this year. And, um, and, I'm, and I'm extremely pleased to say that specifically in the Northland, um, things are going exceptionally well for us in the Northland in terms of trash collection. We're on time and on task. Um, I think that the Northland gets done nearly every day by 2.30, 3 o'clock where all the trash is collected. Um, we have um, some uh, route verification software that really helps us um, where we have like individual homes and we got little dots on a map so that uh, our collectors are making sure they go by every single dot. We can see where they've been, where they've not been. Um, and if they haven't been somewhere, um, we can make sure that they get there before they leave the route. So we can see all of that uh, before they leave. And I think that's really helped us with our accuracy. Um, but if anything has changed more than anything, it's been, um, you know, hey, we're there earlier. So we just want to encourage everyone to uh, put their trash out by 7 a.m. because uh, we're getting everywhere we need to get a lot faster and a lot sooner than we have in the past. So, um, and again, if you do get a, if we do get a missed call, we do get those taken care of within 24 hours. Um, 
I think the Northland, we probably average maybe 10, 10 to 12 misses a day. Uh, when we're servicing about 12,000 houses, we maybe have 10 to 12 people who come back and pick up. Um, so uh, we're, we're excited about, and we're, we're, we're really happy to see the improvements that we see there in the Northland. Um, you know, uh, one of the a couple of challenges that have happened as well is uh, obviously with the COVID, uh, 19 response and issues with that. Uh, we suspended our neighborhood cleanup programs, and that's been a challenge. Um, I do know that uh, we, some of the dates in the Northland for getting dumpsters and those things have been already taken. Uh, we worked, uh, Forrest and I and uh, Robert Woods worked together to create a couple more weekends to be available to the Northland. You know, it's just really about how the schedule falls and its suspension of the services. But we do plan picking that back up beginning June 1. So um, we'll be certainly uh, back to doing neighborhood cleanups. Um, and then secondly, I would also say that uh, trash trucks are available. We know that dumpsters aren't available on some weekends. We would only encourage people to use uh, trash trucks. What I mean by that is we can work with Robert Woods, we can schedule some trash trucks to be parked there instead of having dumpsters so that we can get those needs to the Northland residents for those cleanups that they desperately need to have happen. So um, all that in a nutshell, that's kind of what's going on. Uh, so everything else is pretty good. Forrest, do you want to add anything? No, I think you covered it pretty well. See if we, anybody has any questions. So. Okay. I, I would just like to add, this is Deb Herman to Councilman Fowler's comments. Councilman Michael didn't just start getting good a couple of years ago. I worked, had the pleasure to work with Michael for several years when we were both much younger. Um, top professional, cares about this city, cares about his job. I don't think Michael ever says no. He finds a way to solve problems and appreciated you then and appreciate you now, Michael. Thank you. Yeah. I, I will comment. There have been instances that we've heard about where um, uh, our trash crews will go and there'll be a house that uh, the trash is not out yet. And or they um, and, and, and somebody who's regularly on time, they even go to knock up, go up and knock on the door and say, are you all right? You know, do we can we take your trash? And if, oh, we just forgot. Well, they'll take it out for them. Uh, and uh, you know, if people have, if there are people who are um, uh, mobility compromised, if you will, they will. Uh, there's a program for that. Just you know, they'll they'll go up and get it for you. So they've been very very active. And and uh, yeah, I I got to working with Michael and Forrest very closely when things started to blow up on us a couple of years ago. And you know, they uh, moved heaven and earth to get things done and get it improved. And it took some council action. Uh, to get it to where they had the tools to do it. But once we got that council action in place, boy, they were on top of it. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm very, very pleased with that. And, and professional to the nth degree, uh, most certainly uh, that's been there. And, and uh, there is a culture in that department of pride in what they do. And these two guys uh, instill that in them. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very happy. It's very good for us to see that. Uh, I a couple of times I've been home and my trash got picked up. I happen to be out front, and I thank them, and they say, "Oh, you're welcome." And they're happy to do it. I mean, these guys are that are picking up in my neighborhood. Uh, they're hustling along and happy, and uh, it's the kind of thing we like to see, and it's been very, very good. So, uh, Deb, are there any other questions for uh, Michael or Forrest? I, I will Hello? say that Michael has exuded great leadership um, in his department. He's been doing uh, he's been doing just an outstanding job. Rainer, are you still listening? Uh, he's done a great, great job uh, down there. Uh, so uh, we're very happy to have him. We do have a couple. Amy Justice wants to compliment Michael and Forrest. Um, I will say that we've gotten a couple of those complaints at NNI that. I overslept this morning, and when I got up at 7.30, they'd already been there. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> <laughs> a 
well, that that means you need to get up earlier. That's all that means. So, no, they do a great job. I see no other questions. Michael Forrest, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Councilman, for having us. Yep, thank you, Councilman, for your support as well. Sir, sure, happy to do it, happy to do it. Uh, Deb, are there any questions? And I'm gonna ask Raina to unmute herself as well, because uh, there may be something for her too. Uh, and Amy can unmute herself as well, because uh, uh, she is by memory bank. I don't remember anything, but Amy does, so. Uh, oh, Councilman Park Shaw, this is the time you can publicly publicly embarrass or compliment your husband. We don't get this chance very often. I'd go for it. Well, you know, thank you for that opportunity, Deb. You know, I know just because I, I've lived it for with him for 20 years and have seen him go out on Easter Sunday to make sure that people's trash is picked up uh, because maybe something, there was an issue or something got missed. So I, and I watch him work six days a week 12 hours a day. And so I know that, you know, his, he is totally committed to serving our, our residents in this community. And so I have nothing but positive things to say as well about his, his, him doing his job. Now, the job he does at home, he may not cook or clean as much as I like, but he does an excellent job for our residents. I think you need to take her to lunch, Michael. Yeah. Y'all killing me. Y'all killing me. <laughs> I got to do my own laundry now. Thank you. <laughs> Councilman, we do have an earlier question about planning. Okay. If you would like to cover that before we, are we done with the solid waste portion? Looks like it. I'm not seeing uh, Michael or Forrest unmute, so. Okay, we have a question from, we have a question from Joe Ernst. There was a recent planning committee meeting pertaining to duplexes in the Green Hill subdivision. I asked why new duplexes start starts aren't evenly divided with other subdivisions. They never answered. For instance, Fountain Hills doesn't have any duplexes. Why? You know, a lot of that is dependent upon what the, the developer, the builder wants to do and where they believe their market is. Um, you know, there's no concerted effort that I'm aware of to say, yeah, you have to have a duplex here, or you have to have a duplex there. It's more a function of the market. Um, and some areas, that, you know, and it's also a function of what the builder or the developer uh, is accustomed to doing. Some of them make a practice of, and that is their market niche, if you will, is to build a duplex where others are more single family. Uh, it's also a function of zoning as well. I think Fountain Hills is generally zoned as single family. Uh, Green Hills, um, depending on the area, uh, is multifamily, which a duplex would fall into a certain category of that, uh, and single family in other areas. So it's, it's a, a variety of factors, but we don't try to intentionally spread out or, or require somebody to build um, uh, multifamily or duplexes in an area where that is, first of all, it's not zoned properly for that, or second of all, it's, it's not something they do. If they want to and they want to change the zoning, then that requires a process to go through. Uh, and uh, usually that, that goes through fairly quickly, uh, but uh, or fairly easily, uh, as long as uh, you know the, the neighborhood is, is good with it. But it's, it's just a function of that. We don't intentionally, uh, uh, spread out, uh, that sort of thing. There are areas that are zoned multifamily uh, and areas that are zoned um, um, single family and so on, uh, just as there are areas that are zoned commercial or uh, uh, various other types of zoning. But I, I hope that answers your question. We, Joe, we've not, uh, uh, clearly there's been no application in the Fountain Hills area to do multifamily. Now, I will say this in connection with the uh, multi-sports complex that will be over near the Fountain Hills area. Uh, there is multifamily planned for the, uh, just to the north, get my direction straight, just to the northwest of that area. And more to the north of it are plans that the multi-sports complex goes through to build single family up there uh, with um, uh, starter homes. Uh, with 50-foot lot fronts. 
So those are in that general vicinity, but they're not right in the Fountain Hills area. All right, sir, I, I appreciate your response. Sure. I don't have any other questions or comments. I would uh, I would like to just tell everyone that NNI's offices are closed to the public and will remain so for an indefinite period of time. Um, but we are all working full time. We are doing home repairs, we're providing service, we're doing virtual block watch trainings, um, and we will provide these virtual meetings for any neighborhood group or any group that would like to have one. Um, just call our offices at 816-454-2000. Um, we will serve the best that we can. We're all working full time. Uh, I will acknowledge uh, J.C. Sanders is still on the line. Uh, he is the current president of Northland Neighborhoods, but he's also my PIAC representative. So he is, is a very close advisor of mine when it comes to uh, dis distribution of PIAC money. And um, Amy is on the line too, and I'll ask her to unmute herself if she has anything uh, she wants to, to tell everybody. Um, no, thank you all for coming um, today, of course, and bringing your own donut and coffee. Um, I think I did touch base in the chat just now um, that I found out the other day that the Inglewood project is running on time and const on construction. So um, I spoke to Maggie Green in um, Public Works, which is a, as Dan knows, she is one of my favorite people. She responds to me really quickly and she's very detailed and she even takes the time out to respond to all of our constituents um, that have their concerns and she's very detailed. Um, but I spoke to her the other day and that is running on time uh, with a, a June um, completion. So I just wanted everybody to be knowing of that. Uh, and I don't know, Dan, are there any other road projects or anything that you might want to update? Uh, yeah, just briefly, a couple. Um, the first, well, I shouldn't say the first segment, but the segment from um, of uh, Green Hills Road uh, south of 76th Street is supposed to go out to bid next week. So hopefully that will get rolling. Uh, 72nd Street is supposed to be done in the fall. Uh, that's got waylaid for a variety of reasons, not the least of which when they got in there and started digging up, they found out that their, uh, their core borings uh, weren't the best. Well, they, they were fine, but core borings just are a very small sample of what the, the subsurface conditions look like. And they found a more generalized area that had been missed by the core borings. And so um, bottom line was the uh, subsurface soil conditions weren't what they needed. So they finally figured out a work around that and that is back under construction. Um, Prairie View Road north of 64th Street is open. Uh, and they begun construction on the Prairie View Road um, improvement south of 64th Street that will be an immense improvement to the traffic in that area. It will take out a stoplight, and that was one of the most dangerous intersections for traffic con uh, uh, collisions in the Northland. And um, so once that gets open, uh, we'll, um, uh, that'll be going, uh, I think, pretty well. Um, Northwood Road is a constant frustration. It's still under construction, but uh, the county is the construction manager on that project, not the city. So <clears throat> we handed that off a couple of years ago and uh, uh, we continue to monitor it, but that is, fun that is primarily a county problem right now. So that one's going. And then um, trying to think, Green Line Creek that is going up into Prairie View Road, or not Prairie View, um, North Platte Purchase uh, is under construction now and that seems to be progressing well. That's essential for the um, uh, Platte R3 school that will be going in that area. So those are all uh, all under, under construction. Uh, Green Hills Road and uh, Platte Purchase north of where construction is right now, both of those are under design. Um, that's dependent, how far we get with that depends on funding, of course, but uh, the design portions are, are proceeding. 
Mr. Sanders, I see that you're unmuted. Did you have a comment? No, just a, well, actually a couple. Thanks, Deb. Um, one is, uh, I apologize for being late. I had some technical issues with the computer, uh, so I didn't get all of the chief's uh, inputs. But one comment I wanted to make was uh, with respect to the next door app, uh, what I'm finding uh, as part of the KCI one is that a lot of neighbors are submitting uh, when they when they see suspicious vehicles, uh, they're they're placing those comments on next door so that people can keep an eye out. Um, and neighborhoods are keeping uh, particular Facebook pages doing the same thing. So uh, that was just a uh, was curious uh, if if the if the police department was tapping into that or had access into those uh, since neighbor it, it ties to the neighborhood watch idea. And um, secondly, just to thank NNI for. Uh, providing this service. Um, it's it's a huge help and much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks. We do have one pressing question, and I had a question. Okay. James Pettish want, would like an explanation of the half cent, quarter cent vote on June 2nd oh. concerning the fire department and village cooperative. And my question is, is, and this um, Councilwoman Park Shaw might want to get involved with this too, where are we on the city manager search? Um, I know there are a lot of interim positions at City Hall. Um, I can't imagine those will be solved until we have a city manager. Are either of you involved in that? I mean, really, we haven't heard anything. So it's the fire department ballot initiative and city manager. All right. Uh, yeah, I'll address the, uh, and I'll ask Randy to mute herself and we both talk about city manager. Um, but, um, yeah, the, uh, it's actually a quarter cent sales tax increase, uh, that is on the ballot. It is to be used, uh, strictly for fire department equipment and facilities. Uh, by equipment, they have hoses that need to be replaced. They need additional personal protective equipment. Um, <coughs> not only for COVID-19, but just for fire protection equipment, uh, the, the uh, coats and, and helmets and so on that they go in need to be replaced from time to time. And there are a lot of similar needs over there. Uh, and more pertinent, I think, to us in the Northland, Station 40 that's down just north of Vivian on North Oak has been shut down for a couple of years uh, because the building was in very, it was in squalid. Let's put it. It was in squalid conditions. It, it had it had uh, sewage problems. Uh, bathroom facilities were inadequate. There was a whole lot of issues there that caused it to be shut down. It needs to be redone and rebuilt so that we get better fire protection in that part of the city. And uh, the funds from uh, the quarter cent sales tax increase will uh, go for that. Uh, those types of improvements. Um, uh, I don't believe if there are any staff or, or uh, salary needs, overtime needs, I don't think it's part of that. Maybe a little bit, but not very much. So it, How, it the, the public safety sales tax from its current quarter percent to a half cent or half percent. So uh, that's long and short of it. Uh, there was some- How can we be assured those projects will occur? Station 40 was supposed to take uh, be taken care of in the last fire safety sales tax, and Station 15 had to, we had to pay for half of it out of other funds because there was no fire safety sales tax dollars left. Yeah, the only thing I can tell you is this will increase the availability of this will increase the funding that's available for that. Now, what happens is that. Uh, some of those needs uh, were supposed to be funded out of the general fund, but the general fund, there's a lot of stresses on it, uh, police and fire protection among the, the greatest. And so this will increase the availability of funds for that. You know, any priority can come along that, that uh, side 
lines or sidelines those, but uh, when you pass a ballot initiative, uh, you have to use the funds for what is on that ballot initiative. So the, the sales taxes that are generated by this, if it passes, have to be used for those types of things that can't be diverted to other uses. So it guarantees that there will be funding for those issues in there. That's the best answer I, I can give you. There, there may be another priority, I don't know what it would be, but if you get in there and say, well, you know, we really need to use it for that. We've got to backfill in other ways, but um, you know, we could only use those monies for what are on the, on the ballot. Um, as to the city manager search, we're supposed to have a business session coming up on that. Other than that, Raina, I don't know, you may know more about it than I do. I have not really heard very much about the status as to where we are. Uh, no, uh, Dan, I haven't heard much on it either. Uh, I'm waiting on our business session, our upcoming business session to get that information as well. Okay, yeah. I, I did hear that there was uh, the, uh, the application was out on the street, if you will. Uh, we do have a, um, uh, a search firm retained. Uh, they have a local officer, primarily out of Chicago, to help us with that, but I've not received any reports as to where they are, what kind of response they're getting or anything else. So uh, I think uh, the COVID-19 stuff has kind of uh, way laid us in many respects, but I agree uh, that uh, we do have a lot of interim positions right now, and I don't believe any of them will be uh, will be filled without uh, uh, until we get a new permanent city manager. On a, I don't think they'll be filled on a permanent basis until we get a new permanent city manager. And, and Dan, if I could just stay for a second, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in your Donuts with Dan event this morning. Uh, I actually have an 11 o'clock meeting that I need to jump off and get on. So I just wanted to, to thank you for the time and you all have an excellent weekend. Thank you for being here. I greatly appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, um, when is the upcoming business session? Richard Hurdick wants to know. And our numbers, our revenue numbers in to determine austerity measures to address the revenue shortfalls. Uh, yeah, I think the bit, I don't know what, how the business session, I don't have the schedule in front of me. It'll either be next week or the week after uh, for the uh, uh, the update on the city manager search. Uh, as for revenue figures, we have March. We haven't gotten April yet. They generally lag a little more than a month. So 1st of June, we would expect April uh, revenue figures. March actually was up a little bit from prior years and actually up from our budget amounts. So March looked really, really good. I have no expectation that uh, April will look nearly so good, <laughs> but we'll just have to wait and see. Um, I, I apologize. I misspoke on James Pettish's question concerning the fire department ballot language. Yeah. His question is about the ballot language. A quarter percent plus half percent does not equal half percent. Okay, yeah, that's the second question I've got on that. Yeah, no, it's a quarter percent plus a quarter percent equals half a percent. And, and the ballot language, if you read it about six times and you get past the grammar, uh, it says that. But I, I admit it's, it's not the clearest in the world. You also, I don't know, Jim, if you and Sue vote in the Clay County, there was a screw up on the Clay County ballot that's uh, been addressed by court order issued Friday, and Clay County is having to reprint all of their ballots because there was a misprint in their language. So if you vote in Clay County, don't go by what's on the county website right now. Uh, there was a screw up there, and Clay County at its own expense is having to reprint all of its ballots. I don't believe we have anything else unless Amy does or someone else does. I really appreciate being able to host this or Northland Neighborhoods really appreciates it. Amy reminds us that the next business session is this coming Thursday at 2 p.m. and you may go to the Kansas City website, City Clerk, if you'd like to, to view those meetings or other upcoming meetings and see the agendas. Okay, Amy, did 
Oh, sorry. Uh, I was going to say, I didn't pull it up here on my computer, but um, do you know what the, uh, do they have the agenda posted for the uh, Thursday business session yet? Uh, they do not. So that link, you might want to go ahead and click on it now um, and then kind of save it as a favorite in your browser. But um, I did kind of want to add when it comes to our website, it's very um, much resourceful with quite a bit of things. I think Frank can add to when it comes to the coronavirus facts and information. Um, there's a complete page with uh, much information there and the health department um, items. But the city clerk, the, the link I provided in the chat, uh, definitely it's, it's handy. You can click on the meeting or, and there's an, an area that says agenda. It will show you the agenda for every single meeting. You can also see who is um, the council people that are on that. Um, so if you can do that, but uh, they will probably publish business session. I assume they usually do it, um, I think by at least Tuesday. So if anybody has any problems getting to that again, just give me, feel free to give me a call and um, I'm gonna put my, my direct number in the chat um, you're welcome to call me and I can get you to where you need to um, on that note. The link she's referring to is on the chat section of the page. Um, and she's also put her phone number there, her office number there. Um, Marty Schutfeltz would like to know what Clay County changed. I you know, I saw it. that a couple of weeks ago. It was a grammatical error. There were about two or three words that were left out that are essential. Uh, and I can't, as I'm sitting here, I can't remember what they were, but it, it, dramat it, it, it resulted in a major misinterpretation of what the ordinance was about. So it had to be changed. I can't remember. Councilman, I, I, do you have any closing remarks? I greatly appreciate your time. Also greatly appreciate Amy Justice and Terry Wolf from NNI is also on here. She has been our great screen manager, getting, getting the PowerPoint up. Um, Northland Neighborhoods is very glad to sponsor this, and we're available at 454-2000. Do you have thank, any closing remarks? Yeah, just to thank you, Deb, and Northland Neighborhoods for facilitating this event. Uh, I'm hopeful that in three months we'll be able to do something uh, more in person, uh, but that's going to depend on uh, uh, how the health of the community is and uh, what Frank tells me I ought to be doing. Uh, I want to thank our presenters, uh, Chief Rick Smith, Frank Thompson, Michael Shaw, and Forrest Decker for being here this morning. And uh, I thank you all for participating, and I look forward to a time that we can um, get together in person again, or if not, we'll do this again. So thank you all very much. Have a great day. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>